just for you to hold us in your arms and just to say that everything is going to be okay, no matter the struggle you carry us through. It is all we ask, Lord. It's through our time of struggle, through our times of need that you just provide. You know, we may be selfish, we may be asking for what we want, but Lord, just give us what we need. We'll take that away. In your son's name, Jacob, we're doing a series called Bought In, and he wrote that song. Wow. Pretty good stuff. Well, as I said, I want to get up to the house. It's sure it's good to be back with you all. To, I'm excited. We're going to embark on a new series called Bought In, uh, emphasis on being bought in by the blood of Christ. And if that's true, then what does that mean for you? What does that mean for me? Uh, before I get started, a few things, uh, order of business I want to take care of. I want to thank Brett and uh, Lee for teaching the word and feeding sheep in my absence. I've heard nothing but wonderful things. I got to hear Lee's message. Uh, just did a phenomenal job. Both of these guys did a fantastic job. Very grateful for them. Uh, I believe Brett's leading worship this morning in a church in East Texas. He'll be doing that for a couple uh, months out there. Had a great opportunity to talk to him off and on these past few weeks and he's doing really well. They're adjusting. What's funny is I used to try to get Brett to go to early morning meetings and he used to laugh at me. And now at Starbucks he's up at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> but just letting you know Brett's doing really well. Uh, is, is Frank here too? Yeah, Frank's here. Frank, you mind coming up? I just wanted to recognize in our absence, I was out of town, Jared was out of town. There's always lots going on, lots of details that need to be taken care of. Uh, you know, Frank's our business assistant. This guy's part time. You wouldn't know it because he's, he just pours himself into this work. And uh, just a little something. Some of you are in incredible debt. 
And for some of you, that could be a couple hundred bucks, and it just feels almost overwhelming. And for some of you, it's thousands. For some of you, it's, perhaps it's thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of debt. Uh, but with debt, there's something that's, it, I find this fascinating. And, and, I, and as I grow older and older, I'm, I'm thinking the Lord just continues to help me see did things I, I just never seen before, and little things like this. He takes little physical things in the physical world, like debt, and uses them to expose spiritual truth. He just does that all the time. Our physical world is really a way for God to expose to us things in the spirit world. And so I've just been thinking about, man, all of us have this incredible, have probably experienced debt at some level, some more than others. We had a couple here a couple years back, uh, um, over $80,000 in debt and a bunch of other things that we're struggling with some employment situations. And this is a little bit of a side note, but they went through a financial peace university and really learned how to use God's resources, God's way, and God put them on a new path and, and uh, they would testify that God completely freed them from all that debt and now have savings and are investing and are able to give to the work of the Lord like they never have. Um, so it's a cool thing. And that's kind of a side note. If you want F to attend that Financial Peace University and learn how to align your, your finances God's way, we do that every spring. We'll do that again, Lord willing, this spring. And you go online and let us know if you're interested in that and we'll make sure you're aware when we start in February. But what I want to speak about this morning is uh, a different kind of debt. Right? There's no debt that compares with sin debt. As overwhelming as debt can be, and it can be, I, I kind of feel like the more financial debt you have, the more stressed you are, the more tense you feel. But your worst financial obligation that you cannot get off your back compares like so small to sin debt. And all of us, Every one of us is born with an incredible, insurmountable sin debt. There's no weight heavier than it. There's nothing more burdensome than that sin debt. There's nothing that leaves us more empty, discontent, unsatisfied, and a sense of hopelessness than our sin debt. I got a call yesterday morning from the Raleigh police. Um, it was through my bride, but they called her to let me know that there had been a suicide yesterday and that um, they were wanting a pastor to come. And so um, I was on some scaffold at my house repairing sheetrock from a, a mess um, and I called Lee and he was out of pocket and so I thought, well, can you run there? And so I headed there and in route they contacted me and said uh, another pastor had just pulled in. But I was thinking about that situation and somebody willing to pull a trigger and end life you imagine that the sense of weightiness that it must take to get to that place and my heart broke and it, it really it caused me again just to be reminded in fact I, I called Fisher my son and I was talking to him and I, I told him about it and I said this is why what we do at Stillwater is so important because it probably would have just taken a glimmer of hope, just a small little flicker of hope in that relationship. And that situation may look different. I want to talk to us for just a few moments about sin debt. This series is called Bought In, and so we've been, we've been bought out of the sin debt in the relationship with God. But I, I want us to grasp the sin debt, remind us of it, four things about it, all of us born into this world are enslaved to sin. And Titus describes it this way. Book of Titus, one of your New Testament books, a little later in the New Testament, he says it this way. We were foolish describing our human condition before we meet Jesus. It's like this. We're foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We just can't help ourselves. We live in malice, he says, and envy, being hated and hating one another. That's the human heart without God. Uh, Second Timothy in Paul's letter to him, he says, people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy. 
Romans boils it down. Paul writes the letter to them and he just says there's no one righteous, not even one. And we know that. We all are enslaved to sin. We can't free ourselves from it. We're in bondage. Isaiah says it in the Old Testament this way. All we like sheep have gone astray. And we all have turned everyone to his own way. In Proverbs it says there's a way that seems right to man. But that way leads to what? Death. We're enslaved to sin. And that's all we know. It's all we can do. We can't change it. We can't fight our way out of it. We can't have enough positive thinking to change that aspect of who we are. It's an unbelievable sin that to be enslaved to sin. Another aspect, because of this sin debt, it causes us to be separated from God. Isaiah says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that he cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so he does not hear you. He's speaking to his people, but he's speaking to the human condition. Romans 3, verse Many of us learn growing up all the sin and fall short of the glory of God. We've become separated because of sin. I shared this yesterday, last night. In fact, I shared it with the, our little band and uh, worship team, graphics and sound. We we're meeting back there in the booth for prayer, and I was sharing with them just last night. I was walking by the RTM Center, and Beth was back there with a few folks working on stuff for tonight's family feast. And there was a young lady back there, 16, 17 years old, and they said she wants to be saved. Oh, wow. I mean, like right now, like here. <laughs> I stopped, I backed up, I went in, I sat down. I said, are you serious? You, you like want to give your life to the Lord? She says, well, a couple weeks ago you were talking about it, and I keep thinking about it. But I had to start with, we were created perfect, put in the garden, and in the image of God and right and perfect relationship, but then because of sin, we became separated. And let that sink in. You remember, some of you can't hardly remember the time when that was the case, but think about that sin that of being completely separated from a holy God. Mm, what a dead. And not only are we separated and enslaved to sin, but the scriptures say that this sin that then leaves us exposed to the wrath of God. John 3, 36, it says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. It's already on him. It just remains on him when they choose not to follow God. Romans says the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Uh, at the well on Tuesday nights, one of the questions we had Tuesday night for the young adults was, have you ever been taught something about God that's just been a, it was kind of a misconception you learned later, it just wasn't true? And one of the things for me, as I was sitting there, I didn't, I didn't pitch in the conversation, I was just kind of listening to them. But one of the things for me is, yeah, we, th we have in our head that a God who is loving cannot also be a God of wrath. But he can and he is. He's holy. He's perfect. And when he looks at sin, his wrath is poured out on sin because of his holiness and the fact that he's just. Of course he's loving. He's kind. He's good. It's why he sent Jesus to die on a cross. But he's holy and he's just. And he must deal rightly with sin. And his wrath is poured out on sin. And so the sin that includes being enslaved to sin. And separated from God. And exposed to his wrath. But the finality of our sin debt. Leaves us condemned to death. You talk about a physical picture that connects us with spiritual truths. It's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. We all are faced regularly with the concept of death. And for those of us who follow Christ, it now is just a passing from one life to another. Eternal life. But for those who don't know God, 
It's passing from death to an eternal death and separation. Galatians says it this way, the works of flesh, who we are without God, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, and when it just sounds like a mess. And he says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do these things, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Revelation says, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, murder, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolatry, goes through his list again, liars, their portion will be the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And you're going, whoa, 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 Pastor, whoa. <laughs> no, we're not like that Southern Baptist every week, hellfire, brimstone, here we go again. You know, it's in here, it's true. <laughs> and I was thinking about this summer, going, man, you can't say those things at church, people won't come back. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know what, I'd rather have people hear the truth and possibly not come back then water down the truth and have them possibly spend an eternity apart from God. Right. Yeah. Yeah. These things are difficult to hear, but they're true. And there's not a person in this room who did not come into this world with an incredible sin, sin debt. And there's no possible way to sugarcoat this, make it sound. My dad used to say, he said, Kurt, you're so lucky. You could fall into a pile of cow manure and you'd come out smelling like a rose. <laughs> Any of you ever heard that saying? No. <laughs> Some of you, or something close, maybe not the same words. <laughs> the sin's not like that. You can't, you, there's just no way you can fall into it, come out smelling anything but like it, unless Christ intervenes. There's nothing you can do. You can't reduce it. You can't remove it. You can't eradicate it. Your church attendance doesn't give you credit. Money in the, the box doesn't go to that account and somehow lessen the blow from sin. It's only through faith in Jesus can your sin debt be paid. And when you trust in Jesus, as I shared with this young lady back here, your debt is paid in full. And God sees you as clean. I put it this way. That Jesus brought us out of our sin debt. And he brought us into relationship with God through faith in his blood. And this has really been pressing on me for the last couple uh, weeks. As I've been praying about this next series. Calling it Bought In. This idea. I was sharing this with my son. What's been on my mind. It's like God has done so much for us in Jesus. And it's like we live so little. I just, I just like, it's so frustrating. And I said, I want to call us as a church to understand what God did for us and then what that, how that ought to cause us to live different for him. And so I was telling my son all these truths. And uh, he says, well, he says, he says, what if you call it bought in? I said, man, I like that. I like that. And so here, here's what I want us to see. Throughout the New Testament, God, through the inspiration, as he's working with these human authors, writing down the scriptures to say what he once said, using their personality so that they record with that air what God wants them to record, he uses multiple different words for this idea of purchase, to buy, to pay for our salvation, to pay for your sin debt. I want to show you this. It's really cool. I hope it will refresh your heart as it has mine. It says this in 2 Timothy, and I'm going to spend a little more time in this particular verse, but not now. I'm coming back to it. But in 2 Timothy 11 through 14, it says this, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Uh, the word used here, redeem, redeem means to release or to, to set free by paying a full ransom price for something. In other words, it's the concept of uh, you once were owned and possessed by someone or, uh, and then through some 
thing, you got separated. And now the ransom says, I'm going to pay the full price, then you can be returned back to your rightful owner. That's the word that's used here. Jesus, latruo, is the word, and it means to release, to set free by paying the full ransom. He paid the full price for our sins so that God's wrath could be satisfied. And that separation and that enslavement to sin and exposure to God's wrath, all paid for, and the ransom has been paid, and now you can be back and released to your rightful owner. That's an awesome truth. Latruo, to release by paying the full ransom. Himself as that ransom. But it's not the only term, it's not the only word used to communicate this idea of being bought. But Paul, he uh, had spent a couple years in Ephesus, we've been talking about that for the last couple months, um, went through some other things, did some other traveling, but now he's near uh, at the point in his life where he's going to head to Jerusalem, and he stops by, he calls the elders from Ephesus where he once served, and he talks to these elders and he says these words in Acts 20, 28. He says to these elders, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you an overseer. Be shepherds of the church of God. It's his church. Which he bought with his own blood. I love this. God <coughs> bought it with his blood. You see, you see that Jesus is like God? <laughs> he bought it with his blood. God, it's his church, and he bought it with his blood. The word here, peripoeomai, another Greek word, when it says he bought with his blood, this word means to fully acquire, to reserve for oneself with deep personal interest. God did that. He bought this church with his own blood, for his own interest. That's the second Greek word. There's a third one. In this context, Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. They're in disarray. They're, they don't look much like called out followers of Jesus. There's a lot of discord and there's a lot of disobedience. And in this particular context, he's honing in on what I believe is one of the most prevalent rampant sins in our culture today is sexual immorality. It comes in many shapes, many sizes, many forms. It's always been an issue in all of time. It certainly was at Corinth. It certainly is in our day. But in the context of addressing sexual immorality, Paul says these words. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? And in their day, they somehow were able to separate in their thinking that what you did in the physical was what different than happened in the spirit realm. They were like two different things. You could live down here in the physical realm and then somehow connect in the spiritual realm and they were like they were different places. And Paul goes, no, that's not true. That's not true. You have the Holy Spirit in you. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple? You house the Holy Spirit in you. And he goes on to say, you've received him from God. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. In other words, the, the sin's got to go because the Holy Spirit moved in there. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. That's what he was calling to. The word here is agorazo, and it means to acquire by purchasing. This is the third Greek word. He bought us, he acquired us by purchasing us as a unique possession. Um, it's kind of this, it's a little different than the ransom thing, Latruo, and it's a little different than the Peripoeomai, which is um, kind of acquiring, buying. This, this really is like, I mean, I mean, it would be like this. I saw uh, online, just, Justin Grimes has an auction thing, and I saw online that he was selling a puzzle, and I love puzzles, and so I bid on it. Somebody bit higher. <laughs> so I bit a little more. <laughs> well, I spent a fortune. Don't tell my bride. No. I ended up getting this puzzle for $12, <laughs> which I thought was an incredible buy. And on vacation, we put a thousand piece puzzle together in five hours as a family. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. okay. But when I bought it, it was mine. It was mine. <laughs> and that's the word. You're not your own. He bought you with a price. You're his. He acquired you 
as a possession of his. You're now his. You're not yours. You're his. You've been bought with a price. You're his possession. You're, the Holy Spirit is in you. You are the temple that housed the Holy Spirit of God. And so what he's writing to the Corinthian church is you've got to stop the sexual immorality. You cannot separate what you do in the body from what you do in the spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in your body. Honor God, therefore, with your bodies. You see it? That's the third time, third different way he says you've been bought. But there's one more. It's ek agarazo. The word agarazo means to acquire by purchase. Ek agarazo. The word ek is one of those prepositions used in Greek that means out of. So you've been like bought out of, fully acquired, like really out of. Galatians 3.13 uses this word, or, or Greek word, and a couple other places, but here's just to give you a flavor. Christ redeemed us. He bought us out, out, like really out from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. It's written, cursed at everyone who hung on a pole or hung on a tree or hung on a cross. You were bought out, not just a little out, you were bought fully out to be his possession. In other words, Jesus bought us out of our sin debt and he bought us into relationship with God. Now I want to go back to St. Titus. I told you I wanted to camp there for just a moment. Titus 2, 13b through 14, it says Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us. And I wanted to highlight this because I think this is really important. He bought us out from all wickedness. In other words, he wants to free us. Not some, not most, but it says from all. We tend, I, I, I said sometimes in my own journey, and I've, I've I'll pass this on. I think sometimes we gauge our level of spirituality by looking at the things that God has already transformed and not the things that still look like the world that are being conformed to the world that he still wants to take care of. In other words, we set, we set, based on our selfishness and that flesh stuff that still exists, we set the things that we surrender and the things we won't surrender. In other words, I am confident that there are still things within each of us that we go, we're just hanging on to it. We won't fully surrender because of what it may cost, what it might take, our selfishness, what, where God might call us to go, and we keep hanging on to some. And he says, no, I've, I've given my son, and he's bought you, he's redeemed you to free you from all wickedness, all of that flesh, every bit of it. It's got to go. I think we're looking for reasons sometimes. We might continue in our sins rather than surrendering to the one who bought us and letting him continue to free us so that we might enjoy more and more and more of him. Yeah, you know, the scriptures I've mentioned just recently, um, that we're slaves to righteousness, Romans says, not slave to sin. We're no longer slave to sin. We're slave to righteousness. The Holy Spirit is always working in us to do the right thing. In Romans 6, it says, should we... Uh, should we continue in sin so we experience the grace of God? I mean, if, if there was sin and God's grace appeared, then should we just continue in sin so we see more of God's grace? And Paul writes there to the church of Romans, may genoite in the Greek. Absolutely not. God forbid. It should not be. That's not grace applied. That's not grace applied to keep on sinning. Grace applied says it's unmerited favor to you and unlimited power and ample supply. You don't have to. Keep sinning. So quit making excuses for living in sin. Quit justifying. Quit rationalizing. Quit picking out the few things where God has transformed and continue to look at the thing that are still conformed to the world. He goes, that's got to go. Uh, you were bought with the blood of Christ. That's got to go. I don't need to tell you what those things are. The Holy Spirit is well able to whisper in your ear, this is not of me. Stop. Out of love for your Savior. And because of his great love, and because you have the power, stop. Don't mock him. Don't minimize what he did on a cross for you. Don't live in blatant rebellion, doing what you know God would have you not do. Jesus bought us from all wickedness.
And then it says, to purify for himself a people that are his very own. He wanted to dramatically change us, to purify for himself a people. Consider for a moment, where are the impurities in your walk? Is it language? Is it sexual immorality? Is it thoughts? Pornography? Greed? Lust? Lying? Stealing? What is it? Because he says, he, he gave Jesus himself to redeem us, to purify for himself a people for his own. In other words, he wants us to look a whole lot different than the world. And many times our lives just don't look that much different. The things we watch, the things we listen to, the conversations we join in, the things we say. So many times we don't look. Do you, does that make sense that he bought us to redeem us, to purify for himself a people, and we ought to look radically different than the rest of the world? It's a pretty costly deal so that we might look different. And I was thinking about this, and it's not just like pick an area here. It's like he wants to invade every area of our lives. He wants it all to look different. You've been bought out and bought in. I was thinking about this. I go out, and I buy you a nice truck. And I say, here's the thing. I'm going to buy you a nice truck, and I just want you to go out. And here's what I want you to do. I'm just going to ask you if I buy you this nice truck. I just There's a couple things I just want you to do with it. And I give you just a few little things. I want you to take these student ministries on the retreat and help get their luggage there. Oh, we have a widow, and she's moving. I just want you to help with that. And if I gave you this truck, and it's brand new, and it's nice, and I just gave you a few things that I just wanted you to do with it, and you took it, you didn't do any of those things with it. In fact, you went out and you abused it. You treated it ridiculously. You tore it up as if you had no care for it. That you would say, that's ignorant. That's inexplainable. It's unexcusable. It's, it's unacceptable. And imagine now God sending his one and only to shed his blood on the cross so that he could free us from all wickedness and purify it us to be a people for himself and then watch us go, no, I'll just go wreck my life and do my own thing. We would say that's anger. It's inexcusable. It's unacceptable. We would all agree to that. And, and so I'm calling us to understand that we have been bought out of sin and bought into relationship from all wickedness that God would purify for himself a people. Mm. Titus, it ends like this, this passage. Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Your translation might say zealous for good works. He just wants to get what he paid for. He wants your life to be changed. He wants other lives to be changed. He wants people to be impacted. He wants people to know about him. He wants you to live zealously for him. He just wants to get what he paid for. God paid a significant price to give you salvation and give you a new life, not so that you can live your old life and live for yourself, but to live yourself for God and for other people. He just wants to get what he paid for. You want to get what you pay for? This is another one of those physical analogies. You go to McDonald's and you get a six-pack, and you or six-piece, not a six-pack, a six-pack. <laughs> Did that come from? <laughs> you want a six piece and you only get five, and it's just a nugget, and you're frustrated wheeling back around and going to get that last nugget. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we do that at our house. <laughs> and there are 20 packs and we get 20 pieces. We all want to get what we paid for, and certainly God desires that His children would be zealous, eager to do what is good. Certainly when we pause for just a moment and think that a ransom has been paid and we are acquired to be a personal possession and out of something and into something completely new and all because of the blood of Jesus. And this stuff's life changing. Last night when I shared this little truth with this young lady, Angelina. Yes, yes, yes. And right back there in the RTM Center, 
she asked the Lord to confess to him her sin, acknowledge that Jesus went to a cross to pay for her stuff, and she asked him to move into her life and change her. Amen. So, praise God. In a moment, we're going to take communion. I can have a band come up. I'm going to. Um, I have. They're back there. They're back there. They're, come on. They're back there in the yard. Yeah. Uh, I have never sung in this church, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> uh, but when I was working on this message, this song kept coming to my mind. And you're going, oh, no, don't do it. No, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, I learned this song when I was a little kid going to student ministry. And I was thinking about this truth. And here's where we're going for the next couple of weeks. We've been bought through the blood of Jesus. He paid our debt, and he paid it in full. And it was a debt I owed, I couldn't pay. It was a debt you owed, and you couldn't pay. The result of that ought to be a life living zealously and eager to do good. And so for the next few weeks, what I want to do is I want to walk us through our vision, our mission, our values, the things that come straight from the scriptures that God has called us to be and called us to do as a church. And I'm just going to be asking, are you bought in? Are you bought in? Because when you're bought in, you live like you're bought in. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Yes. And imagine a church that's bought in, understanding that they've been bought in. Whew, unstoppable. Here's how the song goes. It says, uh, I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. His name is Jesus, and he washed away my sin. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace, cause Jesus paid a debt I could not pay. Now will you help me out? <laughs> Let's sing it together. I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. His name is Jesus. And he washed away my sin. And now I sing a brand new song of amazing grace. So Jesus paid a debt he did not owe. Now I'm going to have you stand and we're going to sing one more time like we've really got it, okay? <laughs> All right, here we go. I owe a debt. change that second service. <laughs> I'm singing this in my head. That sounds good. <laughs> hey, uh, you get that the point. Good. You, you get know. the point. And so this morning, here's what we're going to do. You're standing, and we're going to celebrate communion. And the night before Jesus goes, and he's going to be betrayed, and then ushered before three Jewish trials and three Gentile trials, and put on a cross as an innocent, perfect being, so that he could become that sacrifice. The night before that, he gets with his guys, and he breaks bread, and has a cup, and, uh, and man, this is it, this is it, and he shares it with them, and one of those guys was going to betray him, and he had just washed their feet, knowing that was going to happen, that kind of love, he went and bought and paid the price, and so we take it this morning, and it says to do it in remembrance of what he did. If you don't know him, this, this isn't really for you. It's for those who know him. We, he told us to go back, and every time we do it, once a year, ten times a year, if you do it every week, just do it in remembrance of me. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to just um, get the elements, bring them back, and we'll take them together here in just a moment.
we're going to try to connect you. Get a study and just read the word. I said, I told her to start with Romans. And I said, the, the book of Romans, what you're going to find out is what I just described for you is that you were lost and you had no hope. You could not fix yourself. But God in his love sent Jesus. And when you trust him, you become his. And he'll put his spirit in you and empower you to follow him. And I said, you're going to keep reading. But when you get to chapter 12, it says, you're going to read this about God's miraculous plan of how he gave his son to save you. And then it says, therefore, I beseech you to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your reasonable service. This is the least you can do. And I told her, it's going to go on and say, don't be conformed. Be transformed. Don't be conformed to this world. Have your minds renewed. And I just challenge her just to read the book of Romans. This stuff's for real. <clears throat> Have you been bought in? Because if you've been bought in, you ought to be bought in. May God, may God center this church on him in a way that we can't find ourselves living for anything else because there's nothing else to live for. And if you think there is, you're kidding yourself, and God will help you see the emptiness of your futile ways. He is the only thing worth living for. Go to work living for God. Come home and be with your family living for God. Serve the church living for God. He gave his life for us. And Father, we come to you and we pause and give thanks for the bread. Representing your son's body that was placed on a tree. We came the bread of life for us through his death. We give you thanks and we take this in Jesus' name.
we owe all to you. We owe all to you. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and for that love. The one took cross on our behalf. Thank you for the time to hang out, look in your word, and see what it says. I pray you take these truths and they will continue to speak to us. Bring about life change and bring glory to your name. And send us out, Lord, as a church, being light and darkness, making a difference for your glory. Help us to see the things that are not of you and be willing to give them to you and ask for you, to call on you and to ask you to free us, to walk in the power that you've placed in us, God. We love you. Thank you for loving us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, have a great week. And uh, be like that. See you next week.